Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm out here from Comox, British Columbia, where sometimes it freezes. <laughs> <laughs> but hardly ever. And uh, Danny told me to talk about the power of truth. I've never known anything else, to tell you the truth. Uh, they nicknamed me Dr. Truth in Greenpeace because I didn't let them lie whenever I had the opportunity to stop them. Uh, but then I had to leave because they wouldn't let me do that anymore. Anyways, there's a Galileo Galilei there. This climate change thing is the worst thing that's happened to science and the Enlightenment since Galileo. <laughs> you could mark a lot of different places for where the Enlightenment started, but he was certainly part of it. And of course, uh, he said that the uh, earth revolved around the sun rather than the opposite, which had been the general consensus among 97% of the general public <laughs> until that time, which proves that the 97% are always right, doesn't it? And uh, even if it is a fake 97%. And uh, the, the, the church it was, I believe, uh, sentenced him to death, or at least said they were going to sentence him to death unless he recanted, which he did, and then they sentenced him to house arrest for the rest of his life as a result of telling the truth. And so that's what c truth can get you into a lot of trouble, and the same thing is true today with this climate issue. A lot of people have got into a lot of trouble with this truth. My friend Bob Carter from the University in Queensland in Australia, I think he died of a broken heart because he had a massive heart attack not long after he was censored and fired by his university for daring to speak the skeptic line on climate. And now Peter Ridd, uh, expert on coral reefs, has been essentially fired from his position at the same university for saying that the Great Barrier Reef is not dying. And he is telling the truth. And all the parasites who are collecting all this money, now I think they're giving half a billion dollars to the academe and scientists in Australia to save the reef. How do you save the reef by going out and looking at it? And, and taking photographs of it and measuring things. How does that save the reef? What are they're, they're not being given that money to stop CO2 from going into the atmosphere although it's a lie that that's the cause of anything wrong with the coral reef. The fact of the matter is the coral reef just fine. But as you'll see, uh, there's a reason why they use the coral reef and other such things that nobody can see very easily to make up stories about what's happening in this world. I'm going to tell you a little bit about where I come from. There it is there. I grew up in that house on that float camp on the northwest tip of Vancouver Island in the rainforest there, right next to the Pacific Ocean, which is just over the tops of those mountains in the background. So it's only about five or ten minutes out there, and you're in the briny deep. And uh, there was no road to my village. My father owned that village and had 60 people living there, working on the shoreline cutting trees. And uh, there was no road to our village, so the road didn't come till I was about 16, I guess. And everybody was happy, because now this place would grow. Half the use people use the road to get out. So we learned something about human nature there that day. But uh, you can sort of see why, but I loved it there because I was a child growing up in this idyllic wilderness and when the tide was out, there was big tide flats there that you could walk on in the sunshine or the rain, whatever it may be, and then you could be in the forest or, you know, it was really beautiful. Uh, still is, and I have a home there to this day that my wife and I built 45 years ago when we met. And uh, it's, it's a, f a fantastic spot. So if ever you get a chance to go to Winter Harbor, actually I've met two people here who've been to Winter Harbor uh, in their lifetime. And uh, there's one and there's another and there's another. So a uh, three. Uh, it's a place that a lot of people have been because of the sports fishing there. Uh, it's, it's well known for that. Um, but I was sent off to boarding school in Vancouver at age 14 after going to school by boat from that little float camp for eight years. And uh, I soon found myself at the University of British Columbia. I had excelled in the life sciences, biology, biochemistry, genetics, a little bit of forestry, because that was my, my family's business and the biggest industry in British Columbia, and also a life science. 
And uh, in the mid-60s, I discovered the science of ecology, the, a word which had not yet appeared in the public print and which people did not know. But it goes back for quite a while, about 100 years or so at that time, to the 1860s. The study of soil science on the steppes of the Ukraine is the origin of ecology, the study of all the factors that go together to make the ecosystem and the soil. Uh, and uh, it just blew my mind that you could actually have a science that would bring together everything in the whole earth into one concept of all being interrelated. And it kind of gave me a way of seeing that science also had a spiritual dimension in the infinity of the interrelationships and the chaos that comes out of the earth to make the order of life and all of that. So I got turned on and uh, I became a hippie, of course, in the uh, time of, of that time. And uh, I joined a group in a church basement to uh, plan a voyage against U.S. hydrogen bomb testing. Of course, we decided to take on the world's most powerful organization, which was the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission, uh, and to sail against the hydrogen bomb testing as a symbol of our opposition to the threat of all-out nuclear war, as right then was the height of the Cold War, the Vietnam War, and the threat of all-out nuclear war, the very peak of the Cold War in the early 1970s. And we didn't really want this to happen to all the cities in the world. And uh, so we sailed on that voyage. And amazingly, a ragtag looking bunch of what appeared to be hippies, and we were kind of in the hippie era, but every single one of those people was professional in one way or another, writers and scientists and engineers and, uh, and doctors and lawyers. And uh, we sailed, and that was the last hydrogen bomb the United States ever tested. President Nixon canceled the remaining tests in the series due to overwhelming opposition in the United States and Canada, which we had kind of spearheaded in a way because we became a symbol on our boat sailing towards the tests. And it worked as a media image, as what we called a mind bomb in those days, which today we call going viral. And we went viral as a result of getting up and actually doing something instead of just sitting in our chairs reading and complaining. So on our way back, on our way back from uh, Amchitka in the Aleutians, we were welcomed into the big house of the Namgis Nation at Alert Bay, near my northern Vancouver Island home, where they made us brothers of the tribe. There we learned the legend of the warriors of the rainbow. It's after a Cree legend that says one day when the skies are black and the birds fall dead and the waters are poisoned, that people around the world will join together to save the earth. We named our ship the Rainbow Warrior, and I spent the next 15 years full time on the front lines of the movement around the world in the top committee of Greenpeace. Next, we took on French atmospheric nuclear testing in the South Pacific. France was still detonating atomic and hydrogen bombs in the air in the early 70s, sending radiation around the Southern Hemisphere. They were a little more difficult, but because of our intervention in the Stockholm Environment Conference, the first UN conference on the environment in 1972, we lobbied all the Pacific countries and got New Zealand to put a motion on the floor to condemn atmospheric nuclear testing in that international forum, which overwhelmingly passed much to the chagrin of the French and led eventually to them agreeing to stop testing in the atmosphere and go underground and drilling into the coral reef down deep to set off their atomic weapons. And that continued till long after I left Greenpeace. It wasn't till the mid-90s that nuclear testing ended in the South Pacific and most other places as well. Yeah, but as late as 1985, with that nuclear testing still going on and we still protesting against it every year, French commandos bombed and sank the Rainbow Warrior in Auckland Harbor, killing our photographer. This caused a, a, a huge commotion around the world. It was the first act of terrorism in New Zealand and it was the most famous incident in the history of Greenpeace to this day. It wasn't long after that I left. But let's go back for a little more history, back 10 years to 1975. The first confrontation with the Soviet factory whaling fleet in the North Pacific. I'm driving my Fred, friend Fred, the cameraman, into the Soviet fleet off California, out of sight of land. And we approached the whaling fleet 
Uh, you can see the dead whales tied to the side of the harpoon boat there. They were going to go up that hole in the back of the factory ship to be cut up on deck. They were killing 30,000 whales a year at this time in the North Pacific, the Japanese and Russians combined. But we put ourselves in front of the harpoons in our little boats to protect the fleeing whales and got on television around the world, bringing the Save the Whales movement into everyone's living room for the first time. This resulted four years later in the total cessation of factory whaling in the world's oceans. And today there's only a pittance. It's too bad the Japanese still think it's important to go and kill 500 whales in Antarctica every year. They're going back again this year, apparently. But it, it is nothing and certainly is not an, an endangerment to the survival of whales like the 30,000 a year slaughter was. I wish someone would stop it still. Here I am sitting on a baby seal off the east coast of Canada to save it from the hunter's club where they were wading into the nursing colony of a wild marine mammal and bludgeoning hundreds of thousands of babies to death in front of their mothers. And uh, so the seal was clubbed and skinned and I was hauled off to jail. But this picture appeared in over 3,000 newspapers around the world the next morning. This and many other direct actions brought some necessary changes to the way in which Canada manages its East Coast seal herds. Anyways, why would I leave Greenpeace after all that, after 15 years? Well, there were sort of two reasons. First was the high-level reason. Uh, when we started in Greenpeace, we had a very strong humanitarian orientation. That's the peace in Greenpeace, to save the world from all-out nuclear war. And we had a role in that. As time went on and we focused more on nature issues, whales, seals, and then toxic waste, which is a bad thing people were doing, it, Greenpeace and the rest of the movement drifted into this idea that humans were the enemies of nature, the enemies of the earth. And sort of at a high philosophical level, I know that ecology is about we're all one. Humans are not the enemies of the earth. We are part of evolution. We came from the earth like all the rest of the creatures on this planet, and, and we are all interrelated. We're not like the only evil species, which is kind of how it was characterized. And for me, it's just way too much like original sin, the idea that humans have original sin and everything else is good. And so, no, because I grew up in a, an, an agnostic household, to put it mildly, and uh, I've never been an, a, 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 an institutionalized religious person. I have, a, as I mentioned earlier, I have a strong spiritual side to me in mostly in terms of the, the here and now, the nature and, and this beautiful uh, green and blue planet that we live on. Uh, but I just couldn't continue to belong to an organization that thought humans were the enemies of nature. And then the sharp end of the stick, the pointy end, was that my fellow international directors in 1985, none of whom had any formal science education, just by coincidence, except for me. And uh, they decided that uh, seeing as though chlorine was part of dioxin, DDT, and PCBs, to name a few, chlorinated hydrocarbons, they decided that chlorine was the common denominator of these toxics and should therefore be banned worldwide. So the Ban Chlorine Worldwide campaign was launched Meanwhile, me in the International Council trying to explain to these people, you guys, this is one of the elements in the periodic table. It is one of the building blocks of the universe. 11% of the Earth's crust consists of chlorine. Sorry, it's the 11th most common element in the Earth's crust. And most importantly, it is the most important element of all the elements for public health. Adding chlorine to drinking water and putting it in spas and swimming pools is the biggest advance in the history of public health, and about 85% of our synthetic pharmaceuticals, medicines, are made with chlorine chemistry. Just look at the ingredients on your cold and flu medicines even, and you will see a little CL after many of them. Well, the Greenpeace people have this naive fantasy that there should be nothing toxic, that we should ban all toxic things from the earth. Well, snake venom, isn't going to be banned anytime soon. But even the synthetics, as we call the things we make from elements, we need chlorine as an antiseptic. Why? Because it's toxic. 
against bacteria that are trying to kill us. It stopped the spread of cholera in water, for example. And we still, it's still used widely in the world, not only as a bleaching agent, but as an antiseptic, antibacterial. So I had to leave. Since then, Greenpeace has figured out, and the rest of the movement has figured out a whole bunch of campaigns that are fake. And if you look at all these campaigns, as I go through them, you will see that every one of them is based on something that is either invisible or so remote that no one of us could go and verify its truth with our own eyes. Now, the first principle of science, as in Galileo and Darwin and all the rest, is observation. Seeing something or sensing something with a microscope or a Geiger counter or a telescope or another instrument along with it, which, which basically extends our senses out into the real world where we can observe things happening. And the second most important rule is replication, where if the same thing happens over and over again under similar or identical circumstances, you start to get a strong belief in the truth of this relationship between these things, cause and effect. So let's look at this. All nuclear plants should be shut down due to the dangers they pose. That is all surrounded around radiation which is invisible and cannot be detected by the average person unless they own a Geiger counter. How many of you own a Geiger counter? One, right? And you're probably very much the exception in the general population. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Nuclear reactors are the safest electricity technology in terms of fatalities per generated electricity that there is, much safer than hydroelectric. 90 people died in a hydroelectric accident in Russia not long ago. 250,000 people died in a hydroelectric dam breaching from an earthquake in China in 1975. So actually, hydroelectric is more dangerous than many of the other technologies. But nuclear is the safest. Polar bears are in danger of extinction. In 1970, there were about 6,000 polar bears. Today, there's 25,000 polar bears, and they still say they're in danger of extinction. A bunch of government-funded scientists go for a couple of weeks to the Arctic, look at some polar bears, find one that's dying of starvation, come back with the picture, get it in National Geographic, and apply for their next year's funding to go back again for two or three weeks. And this has been going on over and over and over again for years. Meanwhile, just recently, you may have read that the Nunavut government, along with agreement from the whole Circumpolar Conference of the Inuit, says there's too many polar bears because they're eating people. <laughs> And the climate crazies say, oh, the only reason that's happening is because climate change is driving them into the villages because they're desperate for food. Well, one of the reasons they might be desperate for food is they're overpopulated. <laughs> so there you go. There is a great plastic garbage patch the size of Texas in the Pacific. It does not exist. You can't see it because it's remote. But if you look at a real satellite photograph of the Pacific from space, you cannot see anything except the islands that are out there. The Hawaiian islands are these teeny little dots. There is no Pacific garbage patch. Then they say, albatross and other seabirds, this is, these are remote things, not invisible. Albatross and other seabirds feed plastic to their chicks, mistaking it for food. And Attenborough goes along with that and weeps on the film in the new blue ocean or whatever it's called, weeps openly to the camera, he knows full well, I think he wrote The Secret Life of Birds, he knows full well that the reason the mother albatross is feeding a piece of plastic to the chick is so it will go in its gizzard where it can, just like a pebble does in a land bird, grind the food that they can't eat, can't chew because they got no teeth. Birds have two stomachs, one gizzard and one stomach like ours. They normally pick up pieces of pumice from the sea, from, from the floating on the sea because it's a rock from underwater volcanoes that floats because it's full of air. And so they use that a lot. But often there's not much pumice because there weren't many volcanoes. And so they resort to nuts and pieces of wood. Now they have bits of plastic. 
and they put them in the chick on purpose. Before the chick fledges, they put a big bunch of it in there to get that thing fat quick and digest its food faster because the mother wants the chick to be able to feed itself. And so they load it up full of all this stuff to digest their food. And then before the chick flies, it barfs out what's called a bolus, B-O-L-U-S, which is a big wad of all this solid stuff it's had in its tummy while it's been in the nest. And it, for the rest of its life, it gathers its own uh, stones but there's of pumice, because there's no rocks in the ocean floating around like there are on the land for birds to swallow to, to grind their food. So that's what's going on. The coral reefs are dying all around the world. They said in 19, 2016, April, 93% of the Great Barrier Reef is dead, dying, or about to die, depending on which headline you read. There was a major bleaching event in the Great Barrier Reef. Almost all of it was confined to the northern third, where 97% of the reefs in the northern one-third had some bleaching, was the actual fact. That could have been 1% of each of those reefs, because 97% of them had some bleaching, but some could be anywhere from 1% to 50%. It was actually nowhere near 93% of anything, right? And then two years later, now, headlines are coming out saying, coral reefs show incredible ability to recover from bleaching event, right? But they're not, it's not getting the worldwide coverage that the original bleaching event did. And also, the, most of, the highest biodiversity of coral and, and reef fishes is in the warmest seas in the world, and they are not the Great Barrier Reef. They are the Coral Triangle, Indonesia, Polynesia, the Solomon Islands forms the triangle. I've been there snorkeling twice for two-week expeditions. You would not believe it. Go there if you're a snorkeler, or if you want to learn to be one. Go there. It's amazing, because the soft corals are there that undulate in the currents. And the fish are hundreds of species. This is the warmest oceans in the world. And the truth of the matter is, coral reefs have survived for 400 million years, during which time the Earth was much warmer than it is today, almost the entire period of time. So the thing about coral reefs dying is totally a crock. Then you have genetically modified crops pose a danger to human health and the environment. Back to the invisible. Where is the devil? Where is the ghost in the seed of genetically modified foods? Has anybody seen it? Has anybody put it under a microscope so we can see it? No, because there's nothing there to see. There is nothing there. This is a complete hoax. Substantial equivalence means there is nothing different about the GM variety from the many non-GM varieties that is in any way significant to anything, except it's now resistant to the larvae of moths and butterflies in the case of BT varieties. But nothing in there poses any harm to anyone. And yet they've made people label it. They've turned Monsanto into an evil giant. They're a seed company that also is crop protection chemicals. Hydroelectric dams should be torn down and no more built. No more built applies to Site C in British Columbia, 1,000 megawatts of clean hydroelectric renewable energy. The Greens are opposed to hydroelectric energy, even though it is renewable. The only problem with it is it's really cost-effective and works 24-7. They don't like things that are reliable. <laughs> Pesticide residues in our food cause cancer, birth defects, autism, and brain damage. Zero evidence of that, according to the Cancer Institutes of the U.S. and Canada in a joint study. Yet 30% of cancers in humans are caused by tobacco consumption, and 35% are caused by bad diet, mainly too much fat and cholesterol. Fossil fuels should be banned as CO2 is causing catastrophic climate change. CO2 is invisible, so they can make up any story they want about it. Salamanders are getting shorter. The quality of red wines is declining drastically. Any number of BS stories that come out every day from these people, they just make stuff up. 
So I'm going to focus on this last one for quite a while here. <laughs> There's the curve. It's called the Keeling Curve because Mr. Keeling uh, established the recording station at Mauna Loa on the top of the big island of Hawaii uh, to be away from industrial sources. And they say that this is causing catastrophic human-caused climate change or global warming. It is not, and I will demonstrate how we know that. But there's not everybody believes that. These people not only believe that CO2 will cause catastrophe, but that it already is. All you have to do is look outside your window, they say. And I look outside my window and I see a beautiful mountain range with a glacier on it and covered in trees and an ocean in front that's full of life and birds and fish and ducks. And I'm going, what am I supposed to see when I look out the window? I challenge the whole climate change alarmism people, name me one factor in weather or climate today, because they say weather and climate are different, when in fact climate is just the average weather. But okay, they're different in that sense. Name me one factor that is anywhere near out of line with the last 10,000 years of weather and climate in the Holocene glacial period we're in now, the interglacial period. Nobody has named a single thing that they say is out of line with anything that has happened for 10,000 years. Because there isn't anything happening today that is anywhere out of line with the last 10,000 years. So right off the bat, why would you blame CO2 for nothing? What's it being blamed for if there's nothing happening that is any different than it was for 10,000 years? This is NASA at its worst. They do good things too, but they also collect over a billion dollars in climate change research money from the federal government in the United States. You'll remember when they kept sending missions to Mars, every time they wanted to do a new one, they would say, yeah, there, but there might be life on Mars. You never know. We might find it there, right, to get the money. Because that tweaks people's interest if there might be life on Mars. The very first Mars lander proved there was no life on Mars. I know my friend James Lovelock of the Gaia Hypothesis, who is a medical doctor and a chemist and was hired by NASA, for the first Mars lander to design the life detection technology. When it came back, he said there is no life on Mars. And he did that by understanding the chemical equilibrium between the rock surface and the atmosphere. For example, if you found oxygen on Mars, you would know there was life there. Because oxygen is all life created on our atmosphere. Things like that. He found that the atmosphere was in perfect chemical and physical equilibrium with the surface, and therefore there was nothing altering that. And therefore there was no life on Mars. But they brought that all saw out about 50 times in the next 40 years, or 30 years, in order to justify their Mars missions. And they do this, CO2 controls Earth's temperature to keep getting that funding from the federal government. No credible scientist would ever say that carbon dioxide is basically the only important factor in the climate of planet Earth. But that's what they stoop to say. That's what I mean when I say this issue has destroyed the enlightenment and scientific integrity more than any in the last centuries. One of the reasons not to believe the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is their mandate which inherently conflicts their position. They are mandated to study a change of climate which is attributed directly or indirectly to human activity. Therefore, if they were to find that humans are not the main cause of climate, or that it was not dangerous even if we were the main cause of climate, there would be no reason for them to exist. So they're automatically mandated to side on the side of apocalypse or something really bad. Otherwise, why would we spend billions of dollars on them if, they, if there was nothing to worry about? Which there isn't. Not on this front, anyways. <coughs> this quote has been repeated many times, but the IPCC has never emphasized it. 
The climate system is a coupled, in other words, everything is interconnected, non-linear, in other words, things just don't go in straight lines, chaotic, in other words, everything is chaotic, which is, leads you to complete unpredictability with any kind of normal mathematics, and therefore long-term prediction of future climate states is not possible. And then they go ahead and predict the climate states <laughs> for the future. They purged this website in November 20, 2018. Because I went to find it the other day while I was preparing this presentation. Page not found. Page not found. Page not found. Everywhere it used to be. Because it was in a, quite a few little locations, this quote. It's gone. The Wayback Machine shows clearly that it was purged in November 2018 because it was recorded over 40 times before that from 2001 when it was first published by the IPCC. That's why you shouldn't believe them. Here are the G7 leaders just before the Paris meeting in June, well, five months before the Paris meeting in Indonesia meeting and agreeing to phase out fossil fuel use by the end of the century and simultaneously ending extreme poverty and hunger. <laughs> At least Stephen Harper had the decency to bow his head in shame. <laughs> this, when I saw this, I just could not believe what I, I... A conservative from the oil patch agrees to phase out fossil fuels for the whole country of Canada while on an international mission with the other six G7 leaders. He could have abstained. When I asked the man running for the Premier of Alberta why his fellow conservative would have done such a thing, in public I asked him, he said it must have been aspirational. Does aspirational mean you don't really mean it? I didn't think so. I think it means that's what you would aspire to. Isn't that where the word comes from? So Stephen Harper aspired to ending fossil fuels in Canada quite some time before the oil sands went dry. Because I think they're good to 2,500 or something, aren't they? Yeah. That's what he did. And we must never, ever let a Prime Minister of Canada that comes from Alberta do that again. Well, I, for anywhere else for that matter, says Danny, and of course he's right about that. Yeah, or Saskatchewan, or anywhere. But particularly from Alberta. Because it's some kind of treason. And there's the great celebration, the great victory, the great agreement where all the nations of the world, well, eventually with the exception of the United States of America, where all the nations of the world agreed that this crisis must be averted and we must move forward quickly to reduce fossil fuel consumption and CO2 emissions all over the planet. This is why, the next slide, Canada should quit Paris. Quitting Paris is the most important and only real uh, movement that we can do that is symbolic of rejecting the whole ball of wax. You can't just say, oh, maybe we should reduce CO2 by this much or that much or have a carbon tax of $10 or $20, all this talk. Rejecting Paris means you reject the whole thing because it should be rejected out of hand because it's false. It is a hoax, it is a lie, it is a cheat on the part of China in particular. You see this little downturn here? This was invented for the Paris meeting. This is not true, this is a lie that China reduced its CO2 emissions. Bloomberg and all the rest of the lackeys and usual suspects ran this graph. This is the truth to May 2018 China's emissions set for fastest growth in seven years. It's been going up since then to here. We're here now. That is the truth. 
And that is what we should notice. Canada is down here. There's India, there's Europe and the United States. Europe has actually done this by sacrificing themselves to some extent, although in 1990, when Eastern Europe reunited with the West, they rebuilt all the factories to modern standards and made them twice as efficient with fossil fuels. So a lot of the reduction in European CO2 emissions, where Germany is the biggest emitter, was the result of retooling East Germany. In the United States, it's the result of fracking natural gas and using it to replace coal with about a 10% swing in the electricity production. So neither of these things had anything to do with the Paris Agreement or the Kyoto Agreement or any international agreement. They all just happened because of certain things. Whereas India and China, they're doing more to green the earth than any other countries except, well, these ones here are still doing a pretty good job, but this is going to come up to about here sometime. That's why we should quit Paris. Okay, time scales. This is half a billion years plus. These measurements are made from marine sediment cores, where they drill down into the sediment at the bottom of the ocean, which goes back for more than half a billion years. But for the first half billion, it's pretty accurate in being able to use proxies of different isotopes to determine the temperature of the Earth and the CO2 content of the atmosphere at that time. There is very little correlation. Here's some correlation here. Here's some correlation here. But remember, this, this is a logarithmic scale. So this is only 65 million years here. And this is 500 million years here. So look at this. They are exactly opposite to each other. Not correlated, but negatively correlated. And this is 50 million years here of declining temperatures and 150 million years of declining CO2. So the first 100 million years here, temperature was going up while CO2 was going down. There is no way that this historical record in any way verifies a ca causal relationship between the two. Simply does not at the longest time scale that we have decent data for. Here is a very strong correlation between ice cream sales and shark attacks. <laughs> There's actually a website on correlations that are ridiculous. I, I forget what the second word is, but if you go on the internet and look for... Spurious. spurious, yeah, spurious correlations. It's a beautiful thing. Like Tom Hanks movies are correlated with something to do with earthquakes. But, you know, things like that. It's just full of it. Correlations are much more common than causations because very often a strong correlation like this one where obviously shark attacks don't cause ice cream consumption or vice versa. But a third common factor causes both of them. In this case, summer temperatures cause them to peak because that's when people go swimming and get attacked by sharks and come back on the beach and have an ice cream cone because it's hot. <laughs> You have to always look for those. Here's the last 65 million years. Here's where the dinosaur extinction occurred, where the asteroid hit Yucatan. It was an asteroid that was at least 60 miles in diameter. It penetrated the Earth's crust and brought the magma from below into the stratosphere, where it darkened the Earth for many years and killed 75% of all the species into extinction. But they have since recovered in more numbers than they were before. That's been the history of the extinctions. Here is the Eocene thermal maximum. Earth was ice free here. This is when Antarctic began to glaciate. The Antarctic with all water around it doesn't heat up as much as the northern hemisphere with all land around it at the top. So the Antarctic started to freeze up way before the Arctic and then the northern hemisphere glaciation began about five million years ago. Up until here, Canada's Arctic islands were covered in forests. The remains of those forests are still there. 
And 2.5 million years ago, right about where it crosses this line, is the Pleistocene Ice Age. You can see from here that the last Ice Age was here, 300 million years ago. This Ice Age lasted for 100 million years. This Ice Age has only lasted 2.5 million years so far. We are still in it. It's called the Pleistocene. And here is the last 400,000 years of the Pleistocene. You can see from this, these are the interglacial periods like the one we are in now. These are the depths of the ice ages. See how it's a sawtooth shape. You go into the ice age, into the glaciation, sorry, not ice age. The ice age is the whole thing, two and a half million years. There's been about 44 glaciations during that period. As you go into the glaciation, it's slow. It takes 80,000 years. But you come out of it quickly. Then some blips, because the Milankovitch cycles are three and they're all overlapping and they don't act in perfect synchronicity. But they are what cause these temperature changes. This is the same graph that Al Gore used for his primary fraud in Inconvenient Truth. He said, look, they're obviously strongly correlated, so this proves that CO2 causes the ups and downs in temperature between the glacial periods. No. Why would a change in solar radiation, which is what the Milankovitch cycles amount to, with the changes in the tilt of the Earth and the shape of the orbit, why would the changes in the orbit of the Earth affect CO2? There's no plausible reason for that. But changes in temperature, when the oceans heat, they give off gas, when the, oceans, when the oceans heat, they give off gas. When the oceans cool, they absorb gas. And this is what's happening here, is the oceans are breathing. The oceans contain 45 times as much CO2 as the atmosphere. So a 1% change in oceanic CO2 composition from outgassing and ingassing creates a 45% change in the atmospheric level of CO2. There it goes. But there's one more thing to notice here. Note that the temperature of the interglacial periods is declining and the temperature of the glacial peaks is declining. The Pleistocene is still getting colder by these graphs. In other words, we may just be at the beginning of the Pleistocene, seeing as though the last one lasted 100 million years and this one is only 2.5 million years old. But Predictions are not data. Remember that, and always remember that. Predictions are not data. And the output from computer models are predictions, not data. And the output from computer models depends only on what you put into the computer model. If you put some numbers into a computer model and run it 5,000 times, it will never come out different with the same numbers going in. That is why they are not a crystal ball. They are a tool. There is no crystal ball, as you may know. This is a fun graph. This is the Holocene period that we're in today. This is the, oh, this is the Milankovitch cycle called obliquity, the tilt of the Earth. This first period is the Holocene climate optimum when the Sahara was green and goat herders roamed across it. They have maps showing the names of the towns that were all across the Sahara at that time. They all had to move 5,000 years ago when it broke into the neoglacial. What does that mean? It means new glacial period. That's because the temperature started to drop. This is the beginning of the descent into the next glaciation. It will take 80,000 years if it follows the pattern of the previous four. There you go. The Holocene conundrum is the fact that CO2 came up from about 260 to about 280 parts per million while the temperature dropped. It's called a conundrum because we don't know why. And there are some things we don't know why. Actually, in the climate, most things we don't know why. This illustrates the neoglacial. These are bars indicating the degree, the number and degree of which glaciers are advancing during the neoglacial.
because they've been on and off. You can see there's periods where no glaciers were advancing, where they were retreating, still retreating after they almost all had retreated coming out of the glaciation. This just goes back 12,000 years. The peak of the glaciation was 20,000 years back. So this is the Little Ice Age. The Little Ice Age, peaking at 1700 AD, was the coldest it's been since we came out of the last glaciation. So we are apparently moving into a new glacial period. But at the same time, as you can see here, there are ups and downs within this descent. And there's this little uptick here, which is now. This is the modern warm period. This was the Little Ice Age. This is the Roman warm period. The, sorry, the medieval warm period. This is the Roman warm period. This is the Minoan warm period. These are about 1,000 years apart. So there's ups and downs during the downward trend. So there's cycles upon cycles upon cycles. So depending on what time scale you're looking at, you could say we're warming now because we are. And if it goes according to the last 1,000 years or 2,000 years, we will warm for another 200 years, maybe another degree or so. But then the cooling will resume. And right now we may be in a mini cooling period due to the grand solar minimum, which happen in the midst of these 500 year trends down and up. Because there's other cy little cycles on top of the bigger cycles. And the El Nino and La Nina are cycles that are even smaller. They're on a decadal basis. A few years are, are go by when these cycles happen. So you have to think of it as cycles upon cycles upon cycles upon cycles. This is the longest thermometer record in the world, 300 years about. And uh, actually, I think it's more than that. And this is the trend. This is about the peak here, 1700 here. This is the peak of the Little Ice Age, or the nadir of the Little Ice Age, coming out of the warming period of the medieval, going back there, down to here, then up and up and up and up and up. But this is not very much up. It's like one degree Celsius. This is CO2 emissions on an annual basis. This line is not following that line very carefully. This is the last time the River Thames froze over at London, 1814. Here are all the years when the River Thames froze over during the Little Ice Age. They had big fastes out on the Thames. It was two, about twice per decade. This was the last time. Near, well, 200 years ago. And we're blaming CO2 for the continuation of this slight warming trend. This is from England, from the Hadley Research Center, Center for Climate Prediction. This is from 1910 to 1940. It warmed. Then it cooled. This is when they said another ice age was coming on the front of Newsweek and Time, and in the New York Times, and in scientific literature. And then it started warming again. How do they know what did this isn't the same thing that's do that did this? They don't. They just make up stories. Because this couldn't possibly have been caused by CO2 because we weren't putting enough out at this time to do. Here is where the CO2 started in earnest around 1960. And they're coincidental with this continuation of the modern warm period. They're saying we're responsible for that, but not for this. This is the work of Willie Soon and the Connolly family. Mother, father, and son, all with PhDs in science in Ireland. Collaborated with Willie Soon, who's originally, he's from Malaysia. So these are some of the most brilliant people in the world today. And they, this is a big paper in which they showed that total solar irradiation is far more strongly correlated with the temperature changes that have occurred since 1880 than CO2. This is, this is real. And they took out all the urban weather stations to avoid the urban heat island effect. They just used rural stations around the world in China, North America, and Eurasia. I don't know if this is true anymore, so I'm not going to use it. 
I told you about this already, how much ice there was on these cities just 21,000 years ago. This could happen again, almost certainly will happen again. The next ice glaciation is predicted to be less severe than this one because the Milankovitch cycles are not quite as in sync as they were for the last three or four, but they're going to be again someday, and who knows? We don't know. We never will. This is the sea level rise that occurred as the glaciers melted coming out of the last glaciation, called the mid-latitude low elevation glaciers, the ones that reached down way south of here into the northern tier states. This was 120 meters of sea level rise, approximately 420 feet. And for the last 7,000 years, it's been pretty flat. Now they think, they, they put this graph this way indicating there's been a continual slight rise in the sea for the last 7,000 years, but a lot of people don't believe that because of this. These are islands at Papua at the equator in Indonesia where there's very few storms, if ever, and where the sea laps gently on the rocks of the island. How could this happen if the sea was continuously rising? It could not. It's estimated this took 7,000 years to happen. So what's been happening is through these thousand year warming, cooling, warming, cooling, warming, cooling, the sea has been up and down, up and down, up and down, a foot or two or three maybe, all through those cycles. In other words, coming into the little ice age, the sea would have been dropping. And since 1700, the sea would have been rising slightly because the temperature is increasing. And indeed, sea level rise is an issue, especially in Florida and Holland, where the land is flat. So I tell people it's simple. Whatever's causing sea level rise, okay, it could be a lot of different things. But it doesn't matter because you only got two choices if you're on the sea and the sea is rising. You either move to higher ground or hire the Dutch. Those are your choices, <laughs> right? There is no other choices or a combination of the two, I suppose. But if you're on Manhattan, it makes sense to move to higher ground because it goes up steep. If you're on a real flat place where the water's gonna go inland for 20 miles, it makes sense to build fortifications like they have in Holland. It's easy to make new land. The whole airport in Osaka is built on fill. The Middle East, they're building these beautiful shaped islands everywhere to have oases and resorts on. They're making these islands, right? We know how to build dikes. We've been building them for centuries, the centuries during which the sea has been rising. So I wouldn't call it like the end of the world as uh, AOC is saying, you know, it's gonna be World War II. It's not quite World War II. You won't have to run. It will not catch up with you <laughs> while you are walking away from it. I'm just going to show one indication of no significant change in extreme weather in the last decades. As a matter of fact, there's a reduction in tornadoes in the United States. There's a reduction in hurricanes hitting the continental United States right now. There's a reduction in drought. There's a reduction in floods in many parts of the world. There is no upward trend in all these things, and even the IPCC corroborates that. They say it very clearly, but the media and Greenpeace and the rest of them, they're trying now to make us think that every extreme weather event is because of climate change. Just a few years ago, they were telling us, oh, no, 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 that's not climate, that's just weather. When we said, oh, it's kind of cold last winter, they say, oh, no, no, that's not climate, that's just weather. Now it's only about weather, because the climate isn't changing much, except for there's still weather events, that every time there is one, they say it's caused by climate change. CO2 is the most important food for life on Earth. All life depends on CO2 for its existence. That is the only place the carbon in carbon-based life has come from. The CO2 came from the Earth, from volcanism, but much less of it is coming out today because the Earth has cooled due to the decay of the radiation that makes it hot inside in the first place. And now the Earth is way cooler than it was at the beginning of the Earth when most of the CO2 was put in the air. That's why CO2 has constantly declined in the early years, 
but I'll tell you why it continues to decline up until we came along. Oh yeah, they say these crazy people, remember how these crazy people said it's good to talk to your plants, that it's going to make them happy? <laughs> you are breathing 40,000 parts per million of CO2 on them when you talk to them. <laughs> That's what they eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That will make them happy. It will make them grow faster, just like the plants in a greenhouse where the growers increase the CO2 up to 800 to 10 th to 2,000 ppm sometimes, but 800 to 1,200 is the average range. Gives them 40 to 60 percent increase in yield inside the greenhouse just by putting more CO2 in there. Outside in the real world, on a farm where the farmer can't add CO2 but can add fertilizer and water, CO2 is always the limiting factor to growth because the plants are being given their nutrients and their water and what sun shines. You can't increase that. But you can increase CO2 in a greenhouse and you can also increase CO2 by burning fossil fuels outdoors. This is where the carbon is. This is a complicated looking map but it really has some few components. Let's look first at the trees and plants. This is the respiration, the decomposition from the soil. And this is plant respiration, breathing out CO2 at night and when they decay. This is litter fall, falling on the ground. This is photosynthesis, pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere. These numbers don't balance because some of the CO2 that we're putting into the atmosphere, this green one, and I make this one different from all the others because of it, the difference, which I'll explain in a minute, of, of the nature of it. This is how much CO2 there is in the total atmosphere, 850 billion tons of, CO, of, of, of carbon as CO2. This is all carbon. So it's 850 billion tons of carbon as CO2 in the atmosphere. So just the numbers in plants alone, there's almost as much CO2 in plants as there is in the whole global atmosphere. That's how low it's got. Used to be way higher than that. The ocean contains nearly 40 times, nearly, sorry, nearly 50 times as much CO2 as the atmosphere as I mentioned previously. Fossil fuels under the ground, 5,000 to 10,000 billion tons. Compare that to the amount in the atmosphere. You can see how we can have a big influence by burning a lot of these. But here is where the carbon really is. In carbonaceous rocks, limestone and dolomite, Calcium carbon-8, calcium magnesium carbon-8, all containing carbon from CO2. I'll explain how this happened. This is where the main body of carbon in the earth is, and all of these carbonaceous rocks are of life origin. They didn't come out of the ground by volcanoes. They were made by living creatures, all of these rocks. They are limestone and dolomite. So some people say that because we're only putting 10 billion tons a year of carbon into the atmosphere, and plants are putting 120 billion tons of carbon into the atmosphere, that therefore our contribution to this is only a small percentage. That is confusing what we call in economics the balance sheet with the cash flow statement. This carbon is circulating on an annual basis. Decay in the fall, growth in the spring. That's why the Keeling curve has all those little bumps in it, because the CO2 goes up and down on an annual basis. This 10 billion tons is an addition to the existing carbon cycle in the atmosphere and the land and the oceans. So it adds to the balance sheet, whereas this is just a cash flow, in and out. 
A cash flow is a measurement of change over time. A balance sheet is a snapshot in time. So the balance sheet of the global atmosphere has gone from about 500 billion tons before we started emitting CO2 to 850 billion tons, and we might as well assume that we did all of it. Because actually, only about half of our CO2 emissions, only 5 billion tons of this, are actually ending up in the atmosphere as a measurable increase. The other half is going somewhere else. We think the other half is going into plants in what's called the greening of the earth. But before we get to that, let's look at the culprits. These species, called calcifying marine organisms, range from the microscopic coccolithophores, which are a plant, phytoplankton, the basis of the food chain in the sea. Over half a billion years ago, many marine species learned to control the crystallization of calcium carbonate in order to make armor plating for themselves. There's a soft body inside this rock plating that they have made for themselves. These are the foraminifera. They are an animal, a zooplankton. These little holes in this mesh, these guys fit in there perfect. So these go in huge blooms, huge herds through the sea into the blooms of the coccolithophores and suck them up and eat them. They are the next stage up in the food chain. All of this is calcium carbonate in all of the shellfish, including the crabs and prawns and coral reefs. You can imagine how much biomass, how much mass there is in the coral reefs of this world, especially when it was warmer when they occupied a much wider range in the oceans. 100 million billion tons of carbon have been sequestered by these kinds of species into the bottom of the sea where they've been lost from the cycle, the annual cycle of plants and oceans and air. They, they've been permanently lost. So what we are doing, here's one of those uh, calcareous marine organisms that lived just fine at 2,000 ppm before the dinosaurs went extinct. These are the ammonites. They went extinct with the dinosaurs. They had two great big eyes coming out of here and some tentacles to catch things with. But this is the, a mock-up, but this is how big their shells were. And there were billions of them. And when they died, they all fell to the bottom of the sea and took the carbon with them. Here is the generalized trend of carbon dioxide in the global atmosphere for half a billion years. I won't talk, I could talk for 20 minutes just about this one slide, but don't worry, I won't. You can see that CO2 was drawn down heavily during the Carboniferous when trees evolved. Of course, trees amount to about 90% of global biomass and they're made of carbon. 50% of wood is carbon. So that carbon came out of the atmosphere why it came so low, we don't know for sure, and that's a whole other story. That's why I could spend half an hour right here. But it came back up again for some reason to about 2,000 to 2,500 ppm. In other words, about five times what it is now and about 10 times what it was before we started emitting fossil fuel CO2 and has gradually and inexorably, inexorably gone down over that time. This is not the balance of nature. This is a constant depletion by marine calcareous organisms which were brilliant in their invention of armor plating but inadvertently presaged the end of life by sucking all the CO2 out of the ocean and thereby the atmosphere. Because when you take CO2 out of the ocean, more comes down out of the atmosphere to replace it in an equilibrium, chemical equilibrium between the two. So, this little uptick here, that's us. We did that inadvertently by burning fossil fuels. So both stages, the massive sequestration of CO2 over millions of years by marine calcifiers was inadvertently causing CO2 to go down and the discovery of fossil fuels and their adoption widely 
for 80 some percent of civilization's energy inadvertently replaced a balance to the global carbon cycle and saved us from a continued dow downward spiral. As you can see, because the oceans were cold at the height of the last glaciation, CO2 fell to 180 parts per million. This is only 30 parts per million above the death of plants. It's thought that high elevation forests died because as you go up the air gets thinner and therefore CO2 concentration gets lower. It's thought that those forests died during these, the, during these peaks of glacial periods. Also you can see here when you stretch this thing out from what I showed you before, like I showed you 400,000 years, now I'm showing you less than 50,000 years. You can see that temperature goes up first and CO2 follows it. The lag is approximately 800 years, which one would expect because of ocean circulation. So, this is what was going to happen if humans had not discovered fossil fuels and started to burn them. I first showed this and this hypothesis of the depletion of CO2 by marine calcifying organisms not being replenished by volcanoes anymore because the earth has gone cold in 4.6 billion years. There's the curve. This is what we know for 150 million years. This is what we know. This is what would have happened, presumably. When you don't know what the future is going to bring, extrapolate what has been happening for 150 million years because there's no reason to do it any other way. Because we don't have any reason to go up or down with that line. But we do know that if this had happened, within two to three million years from now, life would begin to die on planet Earth. We are not the enemy of nature, but its salvation. I presented this to the Global Warming Policy Foundation in London at the Society of Chemical Engineers in the center of the city in 2015, just before the Paris meeting. This has not been refuted by anyone. No one has given a critique of this hypothesis, and a lot of people know about it. They just remain silent, because there is, as far as I know, no valid critique. I've put all the pieces together and it took me 30 years to get to this point. In all these different pieces moving around in this system over 500 million years, this is what was going to happen if we didn't do this. The greening of the earth is because of this. A lot of you know this picture. This is Craig Idso, senior, I believe, and his son, is just about to publish a white paper for our CO2 coalition on all the evidence about the increase in growth of plants due to the increase in CO2 that we've caused. And, whoop, and here is the greening of the earth as first shown by the Commonwealth Science and Industry Research Organization in Australia. 35 years of satellite measurement showing that the greening is most pronounced in the driest parts because not only does CO2 elevation as a fertilizer cause increased growth in plants, it makes them more efficient with water because the higher the CO2, the less they have to open their stomatas or the least, less number of stomatas they have to make which are a passageway into them from the air which allows water to come out, transpiration, and when they have less surface area for water to come out, they hold the water better, conserve it better, and now trees are spreading out into grasslands across the dry parts of the U.S. Southwest and indicating the proof of this fact that the trees and the plants are more efficient with water in higher CO2. Now NASA has confirmed that carbon dioxide fertilization is greening the earth. Here's their map, again by satellite. So they're starting to realize, although if you look, read the text under this, it 
tries to say there, that this might not be all good, you know. But that's just a sop. This was an international team of 32 authors from 24 institutions in eight countries. So it's not like one crank producing this here. This is the real deal. This is what's happening to the sun right now. NASA is now also verifying that this is causing a cooling of the upper atmosphere. It's a complicated, but CO2 is actually one of the main reasons that the radiation from the sun escapes back to space because it's the one that's radiating it out in the upper atmosphere. So it also cools the earth as well as warming it slightly but insignificantly through its greenhouse properties. But its radiation properties in the upper atmosphere are actually a more significant factor in that they help cool the earth. The earth can't cool by convection or conduction because convection and conduction do not work in space in a vacuum. The only way the heat can escape the earth is through radiation. And that's happening in the upper atmosphere. Okay, just briefly, you've seen the proposal for the Green New Deal, which basically says we get rid of coal, we get rid of oil, we get rid of natural gas, we get rid of nuclear, and by the way, they also hate hydroelectric, which isn't a big deal in the United States anyways. It's like 3% of their electricity. Nuclear is actually more like, in the States, more like 12 to 15% of their electricity. So it actually, and it's baseload reliable power 24-7. They say that if uh, Ocasio-Cortez gets her way and bans all fossil fuels, that it'll eliminate 10 million jobs in the United States. Oh, is that all it'll do? <laughs> I'll tell you what it'll do. Say we ended it overnight. No more fossil fuels. The rot would begin in the center of the urban places because the food wouldn't get there. The food would be stopped before it got there. And how the hell would it get there anyways? People packing it in there? Are they gonna breed enough draft animals? to move the food into the cities? Trucks can't run on batteries full of food with 40 tons of food in them. So the people will begin to die in the center of the cities from the simple matter of starvation. There'll probably still be water available if the water systems are working for a while. But basically people will begin to starve from the centers out. And guess what people will then eat? Right? Like in boats at sea that don't get found. That's what would happen. It's a lot worse than 10 million people losing their jobs in the oil industry. And as it radiated out from the center, way more than half the population of the earth would die as a result of no food getting to where people need it or being grown or harvested without fossil fuels. Will they go back to oxen like overnight in 10 years from now? No. That's what would happen. And even, even more amazing, there would not be one tree left on this planet. In how many years would it take before every tree had been burned for fuel to stay warm and cook at the very least? They might even figure out how to make some electricity with it, but there wouldn't be very many people left to do it. That's what would happen if we ended fossil fuels, and for goodness sakes, would someone please explain that to the idiots? <laughs> All they're saying is they're going to lose some jobs. <laughs> you, you see what I mean? How do you get the food into those big supermarkets in the cities without gasoline and diesel oil. You just don't. It's impossible. And if you tried, they'd hijack you at the border of the town. Take your food away from you there. High speed rail. High speed rail, that's it. That's the solution. <laughs> you know, all you need is wires for that. <laughs> you just need to hook it up to the wires. You know the wires that are running across the country there. Yeah, they just hook it up to them. 
Anyways, fossil fuels are 100% organic, as in the scientific meaning of the word organic, which is the chemistry of carbon, as opposed to inorganic chemistry, which is the chemistry of everything else. Organic, as a marketing term in food, is nothing but a marketing term in food, and it's fake, and Whole Foods charges twice as much for a fake advantage, which does not exist in this world at all. As a matter of fact, GMO products are likely to cause less aflatoxin poisoning than non-GMO products because the worms didn't burrow into them and take the mold in there with them. Produced 100% by solar energy. All the fossil fuels, that's how they were made. From life, they were made from life. They were not made from death. They were not made from outer space. They were made from living things. When they burned, they produced the two most important foods for life because that's what they were made out of, water and CO2. And it is also the largest storage battery on Earth. And it's a solar storage battery, not a lithium storage battery. It's a renewable storage battery, or at least renewable in the sense that it's organic and made of life. That's what we need to teach people. And we need to teach them this too. There's a whole bunch of charts about this that has to do with wealth and other stuff, but just in terms of how long people live from 1800, average age at 25 or so, you know, it started going up here as industrial age came on, but then boom and boom. How do you argue with that? I'm not saying that CO2 caused people to live longer because they were breathing CO2. CO2, the result of fossil fuel combustion, is what made people live longer and be wealthier and healthier and have more personal freedom, which they also want to end by having no more airplanes in the world. So you have to take a fast train to southern Mexico now. Oh no, Mexico won't have trains, just the states. And not Hawaii either. How are you going to get to Alaska unless you build a fast train through BC or Alberta? You better get an for that. <laughs> okay, there's the, uh, there's the oil sands, there's Edmonton, there's Calgary. As you know, every square inch of the oil sands must be rehabilitated back to a boreal forest ecosystem. When are they going to do that with Edmonton or Calgary here? or Sao Paulo, or Tokyo, or Los Angeles? When are they going to restore those places back to their original ecosystems? Never. But they're going to restore the oil sands right back to how it looked before. There's what it takes to clean up the world's largest natural oil spill. Got to have one of these. Canada build this pipeline. So I told you I had three words for you. The first two are quit Paris. The third is pipelines. And I think it's important to narrow down your objectives and to be very strategic in what you're aiming for and not to spread yourself too wide. If you just focus on quitting Paris and building pipelines, everything else falls together, as far as I can see. Is there another bigger word or as big a word that I should add to my three words? <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, that's how we're going to get this. <laughs> <laughs> and build this pipeline, too. Germaine, thank you so much for such an uplifting presentation you made today. I didn't know some of these facts. And it's nice to know, as we should know in our hearts, that people are good everywhere and smart, too. You know, and that politics distorts the situation so bad when people say bad things, nasty things, and it, that's all the media broadcasts then. They never talk about the nice things people are saying about each other. So, yeah, let's build this. And I so think what you said about putting it away from the, the towns and cities is logical. It's probably easier, actually. There's not so much infrastructure in the way. You know, I mean, just, it just makes sense. You can build 
little feeders off it coming down to where you want that if you need some facilities that are further south. But the main line, that's a great idea, and we should tell everybody about that. So it's okay to have tankers coming in to the east coast of Canada by the hundreds. And a pipeline from the states. That's how a lot of the oil in the east is brought in too, is by pipelines from the states. But it's not right to have pipelines to the Pacific or oil tankers leaving the Pacific side. You know, that's so, it's so completely irrational. You, you actually, I'm a pacifist all my life. I was saying, when talking about this around the table the other day about scrapping when you're a kid, you know. Actually, I have never hit another person. I learned how to talk myself out of that real young. Because I didn't want to be hit myself either, because I wasn't any, I wasn't a boxer or anything. So, but you know what? This this situation makes you want to hit somebody. You don't know who it is, but <laughs> well, you sort of do know who it is. But maybe just a mannequin or something, you know, or an effigy, or or pins in a doll or something, you know, some symbolism to express your grief. We know that you kick yourself in the butt. <laughs> Kick myself in the butt. That's what I have to do. Yeah. <laughs> With my broken leg. <laughs> oh no, that happened afterwards. I'm almost done. This is good enough for me. This is restoration of an oil sands mining area. And how could there be anything wrong with that? And it's only open for about 10, 20 years at the most. So for millions of years, this oil lay there polluting the soil underneath the plants, which miraculously are able to grow on it, even when it's saturated with oil. And we come along and clean up the oil, spend maybe 20 years opening it up to get it clean again. White Sands is named that name for a reason up there. And uh, then it's put back to a beautiful boreal forest. And goodness me, there may be a tree harvest there someday. I bet Greenpeace wouldn't like that, would they? <laughs> Actually took some wood off there. And, and the way they do it, you know, they recontour the land so wildfowl with Ducks Unlimited helping, they make all kinds of habitat that didn't even exist there before because it was all flat, say. When you take flat land and turn it into places where there's pockets for water to collect all around, then the ducks and the geese and other waterfowl shorebirds come in and different vegetation, you get your bulrushes growing around the edge, which wouldn't grow on a place like this, and you make it more biodiverse than it was in the first place. We know how to do that because we're smart. Ecological restoration is a science, and we're good at it. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. I tell you, you got my Twitter here, at Ecosense Now. If any of you want to get involved in a really informative exchange of information, come to my 30,000 followers. There's a lot of crap there. Every once in a while, you get frustrated and you want to kill somebody. <laughs> but you. Try to keep your manners and try to just stick to information exchange. You can, you can exchange graphs, you can change maps, you can change documents, you can change, you can give websites, you can do anything there. It's a massive information exchange potential. And that's all I use it for, oh, except to have fun sometimes. But not, not telling what I ate for breakfast, you know, that's Facebook. <laughs> On Twitter, we're serious about our conversation, not just about climate, but about environmental issues in general. That's where I learned just the other day through a friend over in Asia that Bangladesh was going to approve golden rice within three months for commercial production <laughs> to start the process of ending vitamin A deficiency in South Asia and Africa. There's what you said you were going to do right here. This is what you're going to do, right? So get on with it. Pipelines. Quit Paris. That's what you got to do right there. And uh, there's the pipelines in North America. We don't have many. We need more. <laughs> we got an argument there. Look at this. And why the champagne glasses? Because the bubbles are CO2. And we should celebrate CO2. With me. Celebrate CO2. Thank you.